After reading hundreds of forum posts about trochanteric bursitis, it's abundantly clear that there's a lot of misinformation about what it is, what causes it, what it feels like to have it, and how to treat it. I've seen the most unbelievable recommendations from both medical and non-medical personnel, so I'm hoping that this post will clear out some myths and misconceptions. Hey, it's Glenn here from Mehab, the world's leading physical therapy alternative, where we educate and empower you to take control of your recovery. If you're new here, make sure you click that subscribe button, and all the links we mentioned in the video can be found in the description below. As always, this information is meant for education and demonstration purposes only. With that out of the way, let's get into it. Trochanteric bursitis is more accurately called Greater Trochanteric Pain Syndrome. The change is due to the fact that lateral hip pain can be caused by a number of conditions including lumbar nerve root irritation or compression, hip osteoarthritis, tears in the gluteal muscles, or snapping hip syndrome with little or no bursal involvement. Greater trochanteric pain syndrome occurs most frequently in people between their 40s and 60s, but can occur at any age, with women have a fourfold increase in likelihood of developing lateral hip pain. This is believed to be related to hip and pelvis configuration. Greater trochanteric pain syndrome is typically diagnosed through imaging, x-rays and MRIs, and a physical assessment. It seems that imaging, x-rays and MRIs once again have run into the same problem that they have always had with other areas of the body. While they have an incredible ability to identify abnormalities, they are terrible at telling if those abnormalities are the cause of pain. One study found abnormalities in 62 out of 80 hips but only 33 hips were actually painful. That leaves 29 hips without pain, but with abnormal findings on the MRI. That's 53% with an abnormality and pain, versus 47% with abnormality and having no pain. There's not much of a difference. Interestingly, while typically blamed for lateral hip pain, the same study found 10 painful hips with no signs of bursitis. And nearly half of the participants had bursitis in both their painful hip and their pain-free hip. Bursal changes were most often found in the gluteus medius bursa. What all this means is that changes in a bursa on an image are unlikely to be the cause of symptoms, especially in the absence of other findings. The most common problem found in people with lateral hip pain is actually tendonitis or tendinopathy of the gluteal tendons most frequently in the gluteus medius. Several studies have reported that it's most likely the tendon causing lateral hip pain and probably the precipitating factor in bursa changes. It is more likely that greater trochanteric pain syndrome, especially if the spine and hip have been cleared, is from a gluteal tear, with it occurring most commonly in the gluteus medius followed by the gluteus minimus. One of the most commonly used assessment tools for greater trochanteric hip pain is palpation or pressing on the lateral hip. As one would expect, pain with palpation was almost always found in people with lateral pain. However, pain with palpation provides no insight into what structure is producing the pain, so it has minimal diagnostic value. All it confirms is that the outside of your hip hurts when it's pressed on. As part of a differential diagnosis, the low back should be thoroughly screened for signs and symptoms with a patient history and movement assessment. Signs of pain from a lumbar origin may include sensations of numbness, heaviness, or tingling in the leg, especially if they extend below the knee, symptoms that improve with brief walking, pain with rising from a chair or bed that improves once upright. Additionally, the hip joint should be screened. Signs of hip pathology may include significant loss of motion compared to the other hip, clicking or catching that is painful, and reproduction of symptoms with passive hip movement, meaning it's when someone else moves your hip. Often providers will test your hip abduction strength to identify muscle weakness. However, studies have shown very few incidents of tendon disease or injury in the hips of those identified as having weakness. This shows us that findings of weakness are likely subjective opinion, therefore decreasing their reliability, or that weakness is more likely due to pain rather than tissue damage. The most reliable indication of gluteal tendon injury is called the Trendelenburg gait and it's most commonly recognized by its compensation versus at the actual sign. When standing on one leg as occurs with walking or running, the hip abductors contract, pulling downward on the pelvis, which helps to hold your pelvis level as you pick up your opposite leg to take a step. With a positive Trendelenburg sign, pain or weakness in the hip abductors during walking limits the ability to hold your pelvis level. This causes your opposite hip to drop, making it very difficult to clear the foot to step forward and increases the stress on the abductor tendons. A Trendelenburg gait will look like this. 
Trendelenburg compensation is an attempt to unload the painful hip. It is identified by its penguin-like waddle where a person will lean over the painful hip. Leaning over the painful hip decreases the amount of force the hip abductors have to produce to clear the foot. So how do we fix greater trochanteric pain syndrome? It's important to remember that tissue only gets injured when you exceed its tolerance to stress. If you have lateral hip pain, it is solely because more stress has been placed on it than it could handle. It could be simply walking more than you normally do, taking more stairs than you normally would, laying on your hip for too long on a hard surface, or getting hit on your hip. Regardless of the cause, the outcome is the same, damage to the tissue that results initially in inflammation and pain. The initial response of any tissue damage is inflammation. Inflammation is the body's response to start to clean up and repair the damage. Essentially, the body sends good cells to the injury site to clean up the debris and bring materials to build the scaffolding to repair the damage. During this phase, there is swelling, high sensitivity, and poor tolerance of the tissue to activity. Inflammation typically lasts three to five days, providing that the healing tissue is not re-injured by doing too much too early. The tolerance of injured tissue is significantly decreased for a period of time. If the body perceives too much stress in the tissue, you will have pain. It's basically its way of telling you, hey, I can't tolerate that, you need to back off. The difficulty is, is that the hip is vital in our mobility and our ability to function, and it's the reason it can be so hard to recover. Every time you are on one leg, such as walking or using the stairs, your hip muscles are stressed. Until you can temporarily decrease the load below the tolerance of the tissue to allow the tissue to move out of the inflammatory phase, you will be stuck in a painful state. The question is how do you protect the tissue and still do the things that you need to do? The reality is that often you can't. There are possible ways to temporarily unload the hip. These may include using crutches, a cane, or a walker to help remove weight from the painful leg. Using a crutch or a cane or a walker helps by providing assistance in holding the hips level, thus unloading the damaged tendon. Depending upon the level of sensitivity, you may be able to tolerate partial weight on the leg or you may have to put no weight on it at all. You may need to unload the hip for several days just to make sure you allow the body to move through the inflammatory phase. A good way to know if you're out of the inflammatory phase and a general rule of thumb is when you can get into a position where you have no symptoms, no ache, no throb, no burning, nothing, which is usually at rest. You're likely out of that phase and moving to the next, the reparative phase. This phase has problems of its own and often the phase that people get stuck in. People will rest, have no pain at rest or with low level activities, their symptoms improve, and they attempt to return to their old activity levels. Even though they're feeling better, the tissue tolerance is still very low and easy to exceed, which re-injures the tissue and you slip right back into the inflammatory stage and around and around you go. This cycle needs to be broken quickly, as chronic exposure to this stimulation can result in sensitization of the structures and cause a skewed pain perception. An important side note to keep in mind is that sensation of pain does not always correlate to tissue damage. To learn more about how injuries occur, be sure to check out our video on how you get injured linked in the description below. The key to recovery is the initial unloading of the hip, followed by slow and progressive loading of the structures, allowing time for the tissue to adapt and assess your response. It is attempted to progress too fast that causes problems and delays recovery. Remember, x-rays and MRIs are only part of the story, and problems, especially bursa abnormalities, are often found in the hip images of people with old pain. Statistically, the most likely cause of greater trochanteric pain syndrome is a tear in the gluteal tendon, where it attaches. If you are still having constant symptoms, you should immediately unload the hip as much as you can. If symptoms do not start to decrease in three to five days, you should make sure that your low back and hip joint have been screened thoroughly by a qualified healthcare professional. In our next videos, we're going to show you the best and worst positions for sleeping with lateral hip pain, and also the best exercises to start your recovery once your symptoms are intermittent. Please take a minute to hit the like button, share us with your friends, and so you don't miss any of our videos, click the subscribe and notifications bell. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.